Right, let's do piriformis now. Big piriformis stretch. For those of you who didn't know it, um, well, you already know it, but if you don't, this is what it looks like. We're using our bolster. Some of you may well need two bolsters or three bolsters. But look at how I position myself. I've got my left leg forward and I've got myself all the way over to the left side of the mat so that the whole of my calf is on the mat. We used to set ourselves up like this and then the whole lower leg is kind of in free space. We're coming across further. Also have that shin right at the front edge of the mat there because we're going to go down and do some other stuff. We don't want to run into the mat. The knee angle at the front here is at least 90 degrees. Support on the arms and lower the body over that front knee so that you can stretch the back leg out as far behind you as possible. And then come a little bit upright again. And one of the key aspects of this exercise is to roll the hip of the back leg over and I find now that I've positioned myself on the mat, not only is the calf supported, the glute is supported, but the groin of that back leg is actually contacting the mat as well now, and that feels very comfortable. So you might want to reposition your mat. If you're a bit tighter and you can't roll the hip over, that might not happen, but potentially it will, and it just feels instantly very, very comfortable because I've got all those points of contact now. Awesome. So that's just the setup. Just set ourselves up. So just rest on fingertips or palms, whatever's comfortable, and just get used to that initial position. Now you've done a lot of work on the lower body today in particular, and a lot of work for the whole system yesterday and today combined. So can you just relax in that initial position? Do some tiny little rocking movements. I'm just kind of shifting left and right a little bit. Movements are at the hips, not movements of the chest and shoulders. So just little movements of the hips. Assuming that's possible, it might not be. There might not be any movement available to you. Okay, now come a little bit more upright. Same hand as back leg, put it on the hip. And you're using it as a tactile cue to practice how much can you roll that hip over and then roll it back. Roll it over, roll it back. Now there'll be a little bit of movement of the ribs and the shoulders, but you want to make sure there's some movement in the hips. Does that back leg's hip roll over? What's the amount it can roll over? And then pause. Change the hands over, put the same hand as front hip somewhere just on the hip, so you're feeling that's where my hip is. And then practice how much can you hook that hip back. So we're practicing rotation of the pelvis from both sides. How far can you hook it back? And you might not be able to move it back very much. Be a little bit stricter now and don't let the shoulders move at all. Just hooking that hip back. And that in itself might produce some interesting cramping around the hip, in the groin muscle a little bit. And pause. So we've got the back hip now rolled over as much as we can and got the front hip pulled back. So we've squared up the hips. Breathe and relax there. Now try and do some circles with your pelvis where you're incorporating the rolling of the back hip over and drawing the hip of the front leg back. So we're not doing anything like a maximum stretch now or yet so we can practice moving. Do the circles or figure eights or whatever you can in both directions. And just as a side note, at the same time as I had that kind of upper hamstring niggly ongoing irritating thing, doing these little movements is what fixed it. It kind of sounds horrible, but it kind of grounded out somehow. Just got it right on the right spot. It was very effective. Good. Okay, come down onto full hand support and in fact bend the arms just a little bit. So we're bending forward. I've got my chest right over the mid shin. I'm not going all the way over towards the foot yet, just about there. Stabilizing on my arms, I'm going to do some shifts of my chest and shoulders left and right. 
So one direction will have you going more over towards the front knee, through the shin line, and then going over towards the foot. So we're just exploring how much can we go over towards the foot, which is where we want to end up for the full-on piriformis thing. Just explore that. And then pause in a comfortable distance over towards the front foot, not yet maximum stretch. And let's do the first contraction, the front knee, press it hard down through the bolster. You can maintain the weight on the arms, you can unweight the arms to some extent through to fully unweighting the arms. So you're loaded up at the same time as you're doing that contraction. And stop, take a deep breath in. Try and move your chest a little bit forward, our chest forward cue. Shift your shoulders over towards the foot a little bit more. And then do the second contraction. Locate the little toe of that front foot and you're leading the movement by the little toe. You're trying to sweep that foot through the floor to the outside. That's it. Literally press it through. So this is the piriformis contraction I find Leading with the little toe gives me an instant connection through to the deeper hip muscles. Again, you can work towards unloading the arms there, unweighting the arms. And stop, take a deep breath in. As you breathe out, shift the shoulders a little bit more towards the front foot. Roll the hip of the back leg over, hook the hip of the front leg back a bit more and sink into the bolster. Let your belly relax. So now we can change our hand position. Elbow, same side as front leg. I'm going to come down and put it on the floor there, in front of the bolster. And the other one I'm going to have out to the side here a little bit. And then I've got multiple forces. If I drag back on that elbow, it pulls me forward, really lengthens my spine and rolls the pelvis over. If I use the other arm to pull me to the side, then I'm getting pushed and pulled further towards the piriformis stretch. So adding push-pull forces. Have you maintained something like your plank spinal alignment or have you just completely collapsed in the spine? Try, and this might be a very small available movement, try and untuck the pelvis, stick the bum out in other words, because that's the pelvic tilt that we want for piriformis. Three more deep breaths in and out there. Have you relaxed as much as possible or are you kind of holding yourself rigid, hoping that it will stop soon? Relax into the bolster. Yeah. Okay, when you're ready, just slowly as you breathe in, bring yourself up onto your arms. And then what can feel nice after that is pretty much what John's doing, is the line the back with the legs in a kind of diamond configuration and just lie there for a bit. Wriggle around through the hips and pelvis as much as you feel you want to. Ease things out.
when you start stretching this area properly. Maniacal laughter. But it, it's a passing sensation. Sticking mm. tongues. <coughs> Transcendental experience. Oh, we could just lie here for the next hour. Yeah. Alright, when you are ready, just come up onto your feet, go for a little walk about. Did you get any stretch there, kid? No stretch? Just compression. In the front leg. Right. The reason I suggested that you have to run is that when you're more flexible, what I found is when I love more flexible and you're trying to do this, you're serious on the stretch decrease. When you open out the front knee and pass the knee, that's once you've mounted it, you can actually put your face or your chest on your foot. Opening out the front knee just another 10 degrees gives you a whole new angle of attack on the toes. Once you get past that, it decreases it and it becomes just a front foot traditional handstand stretch. But there's a little bit more than 90 degrees. Or you can do it on the floor. We're just doing it up on a bolster because it's I find unless you've got sufficient flexibility, you can't add any of the movement. It's just too strong. You could do the whole thing on the floor. You might not need to be lifted up on the bolster. I was just about to ask you about the bolster. It absolutely is, but you don't want the stretch to be so strong that we can't incorporate any of these movements. Yeah. Yeah, and as well, Penny, because you're holding it for such a long time, you might be able to do a standard version of the stretch for a couple of minutes on the floor, but you might find doing it on the floor for five, six, seven minutes, it's just, it becomes too intense. So you might need a smaller bolster. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you actually stretch the reformers, you compress that part of the nerves before they come to go through the reformers. And of course, that's going to be a thing that needs for some sensation down the end of it. But this is the way to loosen up that movement of the nerve muscle. Just to get your leg 60 degrees off the floor, the segmental nerves have to be pulled out from the intervertebral brain as well to 15 millimeters, not one or two millimeters. It's that much. And so that movement through all of the places the nerve can be entrapped has to be there in order to be able to flex up the hip. There's two major places of impingement for the sciatic nerve. One is the outer tibial plateau. There's a loop of ligament there that the right hand part of the nerve goes through and it doesn't move through that and it'll feel pain down the finger there. And piriformis is the other. Half the population have one or more nerves going through piriformis. Half, 50% of the latest figures. Not 10% or 20%. Yeah. 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 It's to the other side. Yeah, I think so. This is really easing out after this morning. I was, su I was super sore after your stuff this morning and it's just kind of easing it out. Tomorrow will be another story. <laughs> Double <laughs> that, sorry. <laughs> That's right. There's only now. <laughs> Did you get a stretch there? Yeah. Good. Yeah. I do on one side too. Yeah. You can, we keep going on about the 90 degree knee angle, but if the hamstring sensation is overriding it, then you can close the knee angle enough that we get something more towards the hip end. Yeah, but if you've had that thing in your hamstring, that's in your awareness as well. I get quite as strong, and I, I mean, I said that I had a bit of a niggling hamstring thing, and doing this movement actually resolved that. 
That's what I found. <laughs> okay, so take a bit of time getting yourself set up. You might find you need double bolster. <laughs> so I'm to the outside so that the belly of the calf is there towards the front edge of the mat. The setup is nice. So just pause in that initial position. It feels really good to go forward as you extend the back leg. Then you don't to uh, hip flexor involvement. Okay, and I'm not really bent over, but I'm not fully upright either. I'm just here. And I'm just doing some little wiggles left and right. Tiny little movements. I'm just watching this little ant. I don't think he's got a piriformis. Oh, he's got six. <laughs> 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 yeah. As you get into the stretch, you, you close up the knee angle, that's what happens. That's the hip square. That's the hip square. The knee angle is closed. So you square the hips and then walk the foot out a bit to get okay. into the right position. Okay, so this will be your looser side. So let's try something a little bit different on this side. I'm going to come a little bit more upright here. Opposite hand on the ankle here. And then I'm just going to try coming up and just moving around a little bit. Reaching up, moving around both directions. Little movement. Then the hand that was on the front foot, I'm going to put it out to the side here, lean back a little bit more. I'm stabilizing on there. Change the arms over, Helen. That's it. And then I'm going to do some sideways movements. So this is from a very upright torso, taking me towards that chest towards foot line. Good. How does that feel? Good. Then I'm going to turn it into more of a little rotation here. And again, if this is too much on the lower back, then you could either come forward a little bit or just, just exploring some different movements. Now I'm doing those little circles with the pelvis again in this position. So if you're really tight and you're all the way over here, then it's very hard to do that stuff because you're going to fall off. So you might need a second bolster just to play with it. Okay, let's go back to... Actually, no, let's do hand on back hip and explore how far you can roll over and back on this side. If you want to be super strict about it, then keep the shoulders reasonably still. It's the movement of the hips that we're after. And then change the arms, hand contacting the hip of the front leg and how far can you hook that hip back. I find in this exercise that it's the hooking of the front leg's hip back is way more powerful than the rolling of the hip of the back leg over for me. And obviously the combination would be even stronger again. It's the hooking back that just works. But it does also produce all sorts of sensations at the front here, I find. You get a little bit more compression. Yeah, that's using a little bit more of the waist muscles. I'm trying to actually use the hip muscles to hook back. But yeah, same net effect. Since I've got a duck that's screaming here. Yeah, me too. And I'm pushing this okay. away like this. Yeah. Totally switched it off. Well, <laughs> no, that's true. You can do it like that. Or you can maintain some pressing the knee into the bolster the whole time. Again, reciprocal inhibition. It turns off. Yeah, that's a really good point. All right, let's come to... Finger support or hand support, a little bit of forward bend, a little bit of 
elbow bend and then we did that little drift of the chest and ribs, not just the shoulders, but you want the rib cage to be moving side to side. So if that's too much adductor sensation, then press the knee into the bolster. Maintain a little bit of that contraction force. It can work well. Okay, try and end up a little bit more towards the foot, but it's still not maximum stretch by any means. And let's do the regular contraction. So that front knee, you're going to try and press it down into the bolster. Five, six, seven count, whatever you want to do. You can work towards unweighting the arms a little bit through to completely. And stop. And then leading with the little toe of that front foot, trying to sweep the foot through the floor. That's it. Put a little bit more effort into it if you can. If you're really just getting tired and fried, then just do the regular contraction. And stop. Take a big breath in. Chest forward cue. A little bit of shift towards the front foot. Bend forward. And now let's change to elbow support. Other arm out to the diagonally out from that front foot and you're using a elbow dragging action to lengthen the spine and roll the pelvis over. It can also be, provide a pushing force and then the other arm is pulling you to the side. Push pull force. Breathe deeply and as you breathe out sink into the bolster. Just check in that you're not holding yourself up. Rest. Even if that causes you to come out of the stretch to some extent. Try a tiny bit of wriggling around of any sort, little circles, side to side. Try now to untuck the pelvis, really stick the bottom out. Particularly when you're more flexible, but it's also true when you're not as flexible. Tiny repositioning of the pelvis makes the stretch change from no stretch to a big stretch. Two or three more breaths in and out, if you can. If you need to come out, that's no problem. Okay, and when you're ready, nicest way to come out of this one is just to roll off to the side. And then lie down on your back. But use the mat underneath the knees to provide some support.
come up now to this position, sitting on your bum, leaning back on the hands, feet a bit wide, and we'll do some counter internal rotation movements. We just worked on big external rotation. So the way I like to do this is I've got the feet about double hip width, about 90 degrees at the knees, and I I'm dropping the right leg, that's the focus here. I'm letting the right hip come up so that there's no torque on the knee at all. That's what works for me. Other people find keeping the hips strictly pulled down and then only taking the knee over as far as they want. Okay? So we're not using this as a big stretch, we're using it as a countering movement to the big external rotator stretch that you did. And I find just doing multiple semi slow repetitions, not super slow. You can also do a similar thing lying back on your elbows. And I find in this version I can get a bit more movement and then I can just work on little drawing back of the hip movements. It just feels slightly different. That seems to take a bit from my Does it? For me it just changes it feels different. There's some additional thing happening up in here. It just feels different. The range doesn't really change, it just feels different. Okay. Right, your pelvis is tucked, whereas when you're lying back, it's actually untucked to some extent. Yeah. 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 No movement. 